أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلوات قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاذكروني أذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تكفرون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم أعظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه السلام Respected elders, brothers, sisters, salamun alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To show appreciation and thanks to one another is an involuntary action. It's something that happens without us thinking and something that we understand is the right of somebody else. That from the smallest action of holding open a door, to the greatest of actions in saving one's life, we understand that we have to thank one another when you bless a bounty upon me or vice versa. The outward action, whether it be great or small, does not matter. If a king with all his wealth feeds the entire nation on a regular basis, but if there's no sincerity in that action, it's worth very little. And the thanks that he shall be given will also be very little. The true thanks. But come to the Quran and you find a family where the two children were ill. And the mother and father made another that they shall fast for three days if the children were given shafa'ah. And you find that when the children were given shafa'a, not only did the father and the mother and the sons, but also the maid in the house fasted for three days. And every day that they sat down on the table to break their fast, simply with a loaf of bread, a beggar came knocking at the door. And as the beggar knocked, you find that the father gave his loaf, as did the mother, the children and the maid. Three days continuously, this family didn't break their fast with food. And you find that despite the fact that the action was very small, materially what they gave was only a loaf of bread. But you find that an entire surah is revealed because of their actions. That when Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam and Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. made this nother for their children's shafa'a. And when the children al hasanain were given the shafa'a and they did this action, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the verses in which he says, يُوفُونَ بِالنَّظْرِ وَيَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا كَانَ شَرٌ شَرُّهُ مُسْتَطِيرًا That these are the people who fulfill their vows, their promises and oaths to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because they're afraid of a day. They understand the fright of the day of judgment when evil will be widespread. And Allah continues to say, That these are the individuals who feed due to the love they have of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they feed the destitute and they feed the yatim, the orphans. And they feed the prisoners as well. But when they feed, it is amazing what Imam used to say. When Imam used to turn and say, 
We are feeding you, O people, O beggar, solely for the pleasure of Allah. لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا. We don't want you to give us anything in return. Neither do we want you to thank us. We're doing it simply so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with us. And despite the fact that the imam would have nothing to eat, neither would his children or his spouse or his maid, they continued to serve in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Materially what they did was very little. But in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was something immense and great. That it is the only time that an entire surah is revealed due to somebody giving charity in this manner. That doesn't mean that when somebody gives a great deal in charity, or does a great action, that they won't be thanked. You and I today, we sit here, but we're indebted to Khadija alayhi salam. That the wealth she accumulated single-handedly, from the trade she was doing and what she inherited from her father, she used all of it to spread and propagate the religion of Islam. From a life that was extremely comfortable, overnight she was ready to give it up for a life of difficulty and pain. Simply so there would be a day like today when you and I could sit in comfort with the religion handed to you and I on a plate. For every action, that is done to us. However small it may seem, however great it may seem, we have a duty on our shoulders to thank the one who did the action. But I remind myself and yourself that we will never be able to repay somebody when they do something to us. You look at the example of a mother who wakes up in the middle of the night to feed her child. There is no pleasure in that. There is no pleasure in giving up one sleep. There is no pleasure in going and feeding a child for continuous half an hour, an hour until the child is satiated. And the crying of the child. And the putting the child back to sleep. And because of that action you find that when this child grows up, even if he gives his entire wealth to his mother, and he looks after his mother until she's very old, and she, he looks after every one of her needs, we believe that he has not even repaid the mother for one drop of milk. Why? Because there's a great difference between the two actions. The mother fed with no other intention and desire except for the love of the child. But the child gives to the mother with two intentions. One is for the love, but the other is to repay. He has a want in his heart. That I am indebted to my mother. So I need to do this action whether I like it or not. But the mother had a choice to feed or not. But she did it simply out of the love that she had for the child. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions explicitly in the Quran. وَوَصَّيْنَ insan day. We have enjoyed man to care for his parents. To look after them. To care for them. Meaning however old you become, however rich you become, however knowledgeable beca you become, however much fame you're able to get from the eyes of people, there will always be one person, there will always be two people above you. Your mother and your father. That even if you become more knowledgeable than them, they shall still remain above you. Even if you become more wealthier than them, they will still remain above you. And you will still have to listen to their commands when they command you, so long as it is in, inside the boundaries of the Sharia. وَوَصَّيْنَ insan بِوَالِدَيْهِ We've enjoyed the care of his parents unto mankind. Why? حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا His mother carried him, and she was increasing in her weakness. The more she carried him, the more the months went by, the weaker she became. And then she had to wean him. She had to nourish him for two years. So what does Allah say? What is the duty then to these parents? Then thank me 
and thank your parents and to me is the final destination how indebted we are to our parents that we think about them continuously that we care for them that we try and serve them in every possible manner that if they've passed away we recite something and send the blessings we do a fatiha for them we go to their graves we won't leave them aside but in this verse of Quran, Allah mentioned two types of thanks. He didn't just say, thank your parents. The first thank that comes before thanking your parents, anishkur li, to thank me, to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before you thank anybody else. How can you thank the makhluk without thanking the khaliq? You have to thank the creator first before you and I begin to thank the creation. Both of these have to come together. Imagine when somebody does one action that assists you. That when you're in financial need, somebody does one action by loaning you money and taking you out of that struggle. For the rest of your life, you will be indebted to them. Even if you become the richest of the rich, you will still remember that there was a time when I was in need and this person came and assisted me. But in order to get help from people, you and I need to beg them. You and I need to ask. We need to make ourselves dhalil in the eyes of people. Then they help us. And when they help us, they want in return that we praise them and we always remind them that they helped us and to give them fame. But today's question for you is simple. What hasn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given you? And when was the last time you thanked him for what he's given? Wealth he gave you. Start with the most simplest of things. Your life. The most core part of your existence. The fact that you exist today. Did you ever thank Allah to give you life? Did you ever even ask him to give you life? What is better? Somebody who you have to beg in order for them to give us an existence, a Lord, who you don't even ask, but he still continues to give. That you never asked Allah to be brought into this life, but he gave you life. You didn't ask Allah when you were a child for the ability to communicate with your mother when you were hungry and thirsty. How amazing it is that a child already knows how to cry when he's born. It already knows how to communicate with its mother when it's in need of nourishment. He didn't ask or she didn't ask Allah to teach. Allah gave. Education, intellect, knowledge. Today we are healthy, we see, we touch, we smell. We didn't ask Him for any of this. But He gave it all to us. When we wanted wealth, He gave it. When we wanted a spouse, He provided when we wanted children, He gave us. And one of the greatest gifts Allah has given to you and I is that He's made us amongst those who we know as mutamassikina bi wilayati amir al mu'mineen. That He has made us... That He's made us amongst those people who hold on to the rope of the wilaya of the amir. That we were born into this religion of the Prophet without having to struggle. Have you seen outside when somebody comes into the faith of Islam, how difficult it is for them? The first thing they have to do is accept that what they are believing is wrong. Today, would you be able to believe? Would you be able to doubt that what you think and believe in is wrong? How difficult it is for us to question even our most fundamental principles. That's the journey that person had to go through. To question himself. For every principle that he's held, for every belief that he's held, for every time that he's gone to the synagogue, the Gurudwara, the church, whatever it may be, that he's questioned himself. What I'm doing, is it correct or not? Is it divine or is it not? Is there something better or not? And then he accepts after research and so much knowledge. Sometimes you find that somebody who's become a Muslim is more knowledgeable than Muslims. 
Because he's striven and he's struggled and he's read and he's questioned and he's asked until he's understood the principles and fundamentals of his faith. But sometimes we find many of us, we sit here, we speak to each other about Islam, but we only believe because our parents have taught us. We only believe because we've heard it in lectures. It's not belief because we've questioned and we've gone in search of the truth. It's simple blind following sometimes. But you find that the Ahlul Bayt don't teach blind following. They don't tell you to believe in God because your parents taught you to believe in God. They say you have to struggle. You have to search for the truth yourself and arrive at it. But you and I were gifted. From the time we were born, we were told which path to go in search of. These people then had to find the truth. And then they had to tell their families. Many a family, many a parent has disowned his child. Many a parent stopped speaking to his child, stopped supporting his child, stopped assisting his child, simply because he's come into the faith of Islam. How difficult it is for them. Then they come and try to find a community. And they find that this community is limited to Pakistani. This community to Indians. This community to Iraqi. This one to Afghani. To Iranians. Nobody's ready to welcome them. Where do they go? Wherever they go, they're being discriminated. When they want to get married, this one doesn't want to give his daughter because he's of a different culture. This one doesn't want to give his daughter. He's of a different color. He finds discrimination. Imagine the difficulty this person has to go through. You find even at the Prophet's time, those who were coming into the religion, who were slaves previously, they had a very difficult time. Many are slaves at the time of the Prophet were black. And the Arabs felt that we are greater. We have a better race. We have a lineage that should be praised. How can we marry somebody who used to be a slave? But the Prophet and the Imams took this out. The Imams married slaves. The Imams married black slaves. We find, go and read, search, you'll find many of the Imams. They wanted to show what you and I see in Hajj. What do we see in Hajj? That Allah commands that if you're rich or if you're poor, if you're famous or you're not, you will wear simply two pieces of cloth around you. That cloth will be white and it won't even have stitches in it. You can't tell the difference between king and peasant. That you will rub sweat with one another when you go in the rush to do tawaf. You will touch one another. That when you pray, you do not have the right to select who you stand next to in the prayer. The prayer is not that all the rich people stand in the front and the poor people stand in the back. Wherever you find space to pray, you pray. You get closer to God together with no discrimination. That's what Islam came to teach you and I. That's how Islam wants us to have an outlook on one another. When we understand that these people who have come to the faith have had such a difficult time, that's when we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that from the first breath I took, I was on the path of Amirul Mu'mineen. From the first breath I took, I knew Muhammad and Al Muhammad. I want to narrate to you a story of a friend back in London. He used to be an alcoholic. He used to be a womanizer. He was married, but at the same time, he had an extramarital relationship. He says one day, he was in an accident, or he thought that if he's in an accident, and he's in hospital, and his wife is by his side, and this other lady who, has a, who he has a relationship with comes in, let's say he becomes disabled in this accident, he started thinking to himself, what will happen? That this wife of mine will leave me because of what I've done. And this other woman, when she finds out that I'm disabled, she might not even want to stay with me. There's no commitment to stay with me. He said, I'll be left alone. So he began to think that there must be something real to life. There must be a purpose that I have in this life. So he said he went to religion. And he began to search. And he searched Christianity. And he searched Judaism. And he searched Buddhism. And he searched different religions. But he didn't find what he was looking for. That contentment, that certainty was not there. 
He said, then I began to research about Islam and I found that this is the religion that brings me contentment, peace and certainty. He says, I became a Muslim. I became a Muslim. He said, the first thing I did was I flew to America and I told my father that this is the decision I'm making to become a Muslim. And my father told me, do whatever you think is right. Find the truth and follow it. He says, I became a Muslim. I left alcohol. I left abusing people. He said, now I came to that crossroad. That now I had the decision. Was it Sunni Islam or Shi'i Islam? What do I do? He said, it was at the time of Imam Khomeini's revolution that this was happening. He said, one of my friends who was an alcoholic called me up. And he said, I have a book for you now that you're of this religion. I have a book about this religion. Come and take it from my house. He said, I thought to myself that if I go to his, uh, his house, he'll offer me alcohol. Again, I'll fall into that sin. I've just stopped. I'll stay away. He stays away. Again, his friend calls. Again, he rejects. Again, it continues. Until his friend comes knocking on his door. And he says, you're not coming to me, but I've come to you. This is the book. It's about your religion. Read it. And he goes. He says, I began to read this book. He said, I was mesmerized. Every page I went through, I began to see wisdom. He said, I came to the conclusion that I don't care who this man is. And I don't care which sect he belongs to. But I want to become like this man. He said, I looked at the title of the book. And it was known as Nahjul Balagh. He said, now I looked at Ali ibn Abi Talib and I said to myself, this is what I want to be. This is who I want to follow. And he became a Shia. Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides somebody, gives somebody when they take the first step towards Allah. That this book must have been printed in another part of the world. It must have gone through the publishers and the distributors in other parts, in other shops. Through the hands of multiple people into the house of a drunkard man. And finally found its place into the heart of somebody who was searching for the truth. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at the entire picture and finds what's best for us. He is giving us on a regular basis without us thanking Him. Imagine if we began to thank Him for what He gives us. What wouldn't we able to achieve in this life? What couldn't we gain in this life? Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ When your Lord proclaimed, when He exclaimed, when He announced, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ Allah says, if you thank me, I promise, I will increase, I will give you more. I have given you all of this in your life and you have forgotten me. Imagine what I can give you if you thank me. لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ I will increase if you thank me. But at the same time he says, وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ But if you're ungrateful to me, then my punishment is severe. If you reject, then my punishment is going to be severe. What does it mean to be ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What does it mean to thank Allah? How do you thank Allah? We spoke about one method previously, that every mercy He gives us, we use it in the right way. Come to another tradition of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Imam says, Allah revealed unto Musa. And he said, O oh Musa, thank me in the way that I desire and I ought to be thanked. Paraphrasing. So Musa says, O oh Allah, how is it possible that I thank you how you deserve to be thanked when every bounty that I thank you with is from you? That when I use my tongue to thank you, this tongue that I use is because of you. It is like, the analogy of a child, when a child goes to the garden of his parents and takes a flower and comes back to the parent and says, this is a gift. Thank you for everything you've done. What has the child done? The child 
has gone to the property of the parent, taken a flower from the garden of the parent, and given it back to the parent, but yet the parent loves him, has mercy on him, and gives him more because of the action of thanks that he did. The parent doesn't look at what the child gave, whether it's a rose or a tulip, whether it's alive or dead, doesn't matter. It's the action, the sincerity and the thought that went behind that gratitude. In the same way, when you raise your hands to Allah, He gives you these hands. He gives me the ability to raise them to the sky. He gives me the ability to speak. Everything I'm doing is from Him. Yet when I thank Him, He still gives me more. And He accepts it as if I've done an action of thanks. This is His mercy that He has upon you and I. Musa says, Oh Allah, how should I thank you? Allah replies and says, Oh Musa, you can thank me by acknowledging that everything is from me. Understand that everything that happens is from me. That when somebody gives you food, when you sit on the table to eat with your children, don't you teach your children to thank Allah before they eat? So they shouldn't think that it's the mother and the father who has given me this food. That they should think that there's someone else who gave the mother and the father the ability to work and buy and cook and bring this food. That the parents were simply a tool that Allah used to bring me this food. That tomorrow when the doctor makes you save your life, he saves your life for you. You thank the doctor but you remember that it was only with the permission of Allah that my life was safe. How many a people have you seen that the doctors don't understand what's happening? They've put them on a life support machine. They've given them all the medicine possible. But still Allah takes their soul. Even if you put an artificial heart inside a soul, if the time has come to go, he goes. Yet you find that there are some people or the doctors haven't got to them yet. But they remain after an earthquake for three days, one week, they remain under rubble and they find them and they're still alive. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give, He will make sure He gives. But He will give you extra if you simply begin to thank Him. Acknowledge that everything is coming from Him and that is one of the best ways to thank Him. I wish to end by reminding us of a verse of the Qur'an. If the action of thanks had a greater action above it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he would have talked about those people in the Qur'an. But there's a very special verse in the Qur'an when it comes to this group of people who thank Allah. And it breaks the heart to understand that this is what reality is. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنْ عِبَادِي الشَّكُورٌ that there's only a handful of people, not from creation, there's only a handful of people, min ibadi, from my servants who are thankful. Even from my servants, there are those who are not thankful to me. There are those who reject me, who forget me. There are those who only come knocking at my door when they want something from me, not when I want something from them. How many a times we turn our hands to Allah and our face towards Him. We ask Him for something and He doesn't give. And we think Allah doesn't love. We say, what type of Lord is this? That He doesn't give to His servant. We don't understand that this Lord is more merciful and loving than a parent. That He looks for every avenue possible. He looks at what will happen if He gives you this until the end of your life, how it will impact every avenue, every perspective of your life. There's an alim known as Nukhudaki, married in, buried in Mashhad, in the Sahan of Imam al Rada. He's known as a great mystic, somebody who was very close and had inner knowledge and insight of Allah. One lover of Imam al Rada used to go to the grave of the Imam, ask the Imam, please give me this, please give me this. One particular hajah he had, he was never given that hajah. After many a times of trying, he thought to himself, maybe Imam doesn't love me. Let me try the scholar instead. We know that even the ulama can do shifa'a and intercession. 
He went to the grave of the scholar and he said, Oh scholar, this is what I want. And he found that the next day it was given to him. And he thought to himself, maybe the imam doesn't love me. Maybe the imam isn't listening to me. The scholar gave me, but the imam didn't give. He says, after a few days, after a few weeks, I found out that what I asked for was actually harmful for me. It was working against me. And now I was trying to get rid of it. He said, so now I return back to the scholar. And I said, oh scholar, if you don't know when to give, then don't give. You have to understand, will this be beneficial for me or not? When we do tawassul, we don't ask the imam without Allah. That would be shirk. We ask the imam with full knowledge that only the imam can give if Allah gives permission. That's how we understand tawassul. That's how we're allowed to ask through the imams and the prophet. And if they don't give, then understand that there must be a lesson in it for us. There must be something beneficial for us. How many possibilities there are of things going wrong? That if somebody asks, Oh Allah, if he's in a final stage, final breath, and he tells Allah, Oh Allah, please I want more life. And his family prays that he is given shifa, but Allah doesn't give shifa for him. How many more things could have gone wrong in this man's life? Maybe he would have got life. Maybe he would have done something haram later on that would have wiped out all of his good deeds. Allah looks after his servant. You ask, oh Allah, please let me go for ziyar of imam. Allah doesn't give you permission. Maybe you would have been in Baghdad at that time when a bomb went off and you would have died. How many possibilities there are? That's when we understand, Antumul fuqara'u ilallah. You are poor people and beggars in the face of Allah. And it is Allah that is rich. He knows. Rely on Him. Have absolute certainty on Him. Follow His path. And He shall open up the roads for you. The verse we mentioned yesterday where the Prophet says, فَاتَّبِعُونِي That if you love Allah, then follow me. One of the actions of the Prophet is to rely on Allah. Be certain with what Allah tells you. I ask you, you have read the Quran. Have you, do you remember the verse and the stories of Musa in the Quran? When Musa, who has a lisp in his mouth, Allah tells him, go to the Fir'aun and speak. Musa, he has a lisp. He's frightened of speaking. Stage fright, you may call it. He doesn't feel he's eloquent enough. He says, but my brother Harun, He's more eloquent than me. But Allah said, no Musa, you. I'm looking after you. You go. Musa goes. Speaks to Fir'aun. Musa doesn't know what will happen now. Fir'aun calls the magicians. Look at the reliance and the tawakkal, tawakkul that Musa has to have. That first Musa puts his arm under his armpit and he comes out glowing. Fir'aun calls magicians. Musa has his staff. Musa says, you throw first. They throw down the pieces of rope and it becomes an illusion like it snakes. Imagine if you were in that position, that in your hand is a piece of wood and Allah says, throw it down. Imagine in your minds, you would be thinking, what will happen if I throw down a piece of wood? It will remain a piece of wood. Not for somebody who relies on Allah. He throws down his staff and it becomes a snake and devours the others. And the magicians realize the truth and they fall down in prostration to Allah. But that's not it. Musa is now given another challenge. Musa, take Bani Israel towards the river, towards the lake. Musa goes to the Nile, the Red Sea. Can you imagine what is happening to Musa? That he's taken a few hundred believers with him. And he's got to the ocean, the sea. And nothing's happening. He's standing in front of the sea and nothing is happening. And they're beginning to doubt, Oh Musa, are you sure that there is a Lord? Musa, are you sure that we're meant to come to the Red Sea? Are you sure that your Lord is listening? Are you sure that you're a prophet, Musa? Musa says, wait for the command of Allah. 
They look behind, they see Fir'aun and his armies are coming. Hundreds of thousands of them. But Allah has a plan. وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan. They plan and he plans and he is the best of planners. Musa, wait. Everybody begins to doubt in their faith. Is it true? Is it not? This is where the sincere remains steadfast like Musa. As Fir'aun and the hundreds if not thousands come with Fir'aun. Now Allah says, strike the sea with your staff. And it parts. It parts and Musa walks through with his companions. Imagine... If the sea had parted, whilst Fir'aun hadn't yet left his palace, they would have been saved and Fir'aun would have been saved. But the plan of Allah was that, Mu- that Fir'aun also tries to cross and that the sea takes Fir'aun and brings him to his infantil end. It only happens to people who believe in God. Only happens to people who trust in God. It only happens to people who are thankful for every bounty that comes before them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the greatest bounties that you and I have in our life is the bounty of our children. That many a time you find individuals who don't have children and you can understand the pain in their hearts. And you see those, alhamdulillah, who Allah has blessed with children And you understand that it is a gift from Allah. And it is a gift that a parent never wants to see being pained, being hurt, or worst of all, taken away from him. A parent will always pray that their children have a long life, even if they pass away. Because they know they're older. But they will not be able to bear the sight of their children passing away in front of them. Whereas the child might be able to bury the father, it is very difficult for a father to bury his child. You find that on the day of Ashura, the companions of Aba Abdullah go one by one towards the battlefield. They're martyred and they return back to Allah. Then it comes the time that the companions have all gone. And the only people who remain are those from the family of Hussein. Look at how Imam sets an example for you and I. Allah says in the Quran that you give that which you love. Imam, he had all of his family around him. He could have called for his nephew to come. He could have called for his brother to come. But he gives the person who is closest. He called for his son, Ali Nil Akbar. And he tells Ali that you are now going to the battlefield. If you look into the maqatil, you find that all the other people had to come and ask for permission and Imam was hesitant. But with Ali Nil Akbar, Imam wanted to set an example that I shall give my own family first before I give the family of my extended Before I give Hassan's child and Hassan's son, I will first give my own son. Imam is now bidding farewell to Ali al-Akbar. And Imam turns around and says the following. He says, Oh Allah, be a witness upon these men that this is the youth who resembles your Prophet the most. That when we wanted to look at the Prophet's face, we used to look at Ali in Al-Akbar. When we wanted to listen to the Prophet's Adhan, we would listen to the Adhan of Ali in Al-Akbar. Today, O oh Allah, it is these people who are going to be cutting off my lineage. And Imam prays and he says, O oh enemies, may Allah cut off your lineage just like you're about to cut off my lineage. How does a father begin to bid farewell to his son? A young, youthful son. How many dreams you have for your children? Marriage, education, grandchildren. And now you see your child in front of you preparing 
to go to fight in the battlefield. Imam turns and he puts his child and his son and he mounts him on the horse, gives him the armor and the sword and the shield. And Ali begins to go to the battlefield. Ali fights with such strength. A hundred and twenty men come crashing to the ground because of his sword. When he gives a cry, he says, Oh people, I shall fight you until my sword is bent. And he kills to such an extent that the enemies begin to tremble and wonder, will they win this battle? Because of people from the sons of Hashem like Ali. Then a strange thing happens, brothers. Something very strange that has never happened to any other father on this planet. That the child turns around and begins to come back to the father. Tell me when in your life has your young child come to you and told you, Oh dad, oh father, I'm thirsty, give me water. When have you not been able to give them water? Every time your child gives you water, whether you're pleased with the child or you're not pleased with the child, the one thing you don't hold back from friend or enemy is water. Ali and Ilakabal turns, comes back to Imam and he says, Oh my father, the weight of this iron armor is taking my energy. Oh father, it's extremely hot out there. Oh father, my tongue is dry. I have no water. Oh father, give me a bit of water and I will be able to continue. I'll finish off the enemies. Imam asks Ali, Oh Ali, come closer my son. Oh Ali, put your tongue in my mouth. Ali, no notices that Imam's tongue is much more dry than his tongue. Ali notices that Imam's lips are much more parched than his. Imam takes his ring, he puts it into the mouth of Ali, and he says, Oh Ali, I pray that soon you shall be given a drink from Kotha, after which you shall never be thirsty. Ali turns back, again he bids his final farewell to his family. Zainab knows that now Ali is going, Ali will not come back. Hussein knows that now my son is going. The next time I see him, he shall not be in a state to speak to me. Ali goes to the battlefield. He begins to kill the enemies and send them to hell one by one. Finally, an accursed man sees that Ali's back is turned to him. He takes a spear and he throws it into the back of Ali. It pierces through Ali. Ali comes crashing to the ground. Still Ali begins to fight. People throw stones. Arrows are thrown. Ali comes crashing to the ground. He calls out, Assalamu alayka ya abata. Oh my father, salam upon you. Imam comes rushing to the battlefield. Imam sees that Ali is overpouring with blood. But do you know what happened when Ali came to the ground? The enemies surrounded him. They took their sword. They began to stab him in any possible manner. They cut him into small pieces. Ala la'anatullahi ala al-qawm al-zalimeen. Fasayalamu al-lazina zalamu ayyamun qalibiyan qalibun. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'un. Radham bi qadaihi wa tasliman li amrih. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our azah of Aba Abdullah al-Husayn alayhi salam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of these tears that we shed for Imam, that Allah forgives us, forgives our parents, keeps us on the right path until our final breath. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ziyara and shifa of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam for dunya wal akhara. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.